I guess let's just oh, let's just jump in here. <laughs> All right, uh, next slide. So the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, also known as the Climate Act, um, has mandated a climate neutral economy with at least an 85% reduction in emissions below 1990 levels by 2050. Um, some other pieces to that include a 40% reduction in emissions by 2030, 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040, 70% renewable electricity by 2030, and including um, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035, 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar by 2025, 3,000 megawatts of energy storage by 2030, 185 um, trillion British thermal units of on-site energy savings by 2025, and commitments on climate justice and just transition. So there is a lot that is included in the CLCPA, as I'm sure you all have known by its 400 pages, like Jackie mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide. So looking at the current sector, greenhouse gas emissions, um, buildings and transportation are really in the lead with greenhouse gas emissions at the current time. Um, electricity generation and waste follow that. And um, industrial processes, agriculture industry, and let's see, fugitive emissions are all kind of in a smaller lump behind there. And you can see the chart on the right looks at New York State's greenhouse gas emissions reductions that would be required. All of those goals. So the scoping plan was developed um, over the past three years. It was just released in December 2022. And it represents three years of a lot of work from a lot of different people. There are seven sector-specific advisory panels a just transition working group, and a climate justice working group, all working together to kind of put this together. It was also informed by a six month public comment period and had 11 public hearings and more than 3, 35,000 written comments. So the plan prioritizes climate justice, job creation, cost reductions, public health benefits, and minimizing emission leakage as well. And there's been the integration analysis that undertakes comprehensive, comprehensive cost benefit analyses to look at the different impacts and interactions of different strategies across the sectors and look at different, I guess, implementation of strategies for each of the different sectors. There's also recommendations on both sector specific and cross sector actions to achieve the climate acts goals and requirements. So in my talk, I'm really going to be focusing on agriculture and forestry. Um, I do have to kind of warn you that I don't have a ton of background in the agriculture side of things. So a lot of my presentation will be focused on the forestry side of things. But first I'll start with agriculture. Next slide. So agriculture in the grand scheme of our emissions right now represents about 6% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, from agriculture's emissions, about 62% of that comes from livestock digestion, 31% of that comes from manure management, and about 7% comes from soil management techniques. And in addition to these emissions, also included inside like natural working lands, carbon sequestration, which is the opposite of emissions, um, croplands, emit an additional 0.48 million metric tons of carbon dioxide each year due to land conversion, typically land conversion from forest area. And if you look at the, ch the table that's there, um, agriculture emissions over time due to livestock stock largely have increased since 1990 levels. Uh, next slide. So thinking about how agriculture 
um, implementation will be conducted and what we can actually do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the agriculture sector, a majority of emission reduction is expected to happen through manure management, which is that yellow part of the graph right there. You see that's one of the few places where there's like a big reduction, uh, I guess, feasible inside the agriculture sector by 2050 right now based on the integration analysis. Next slide. So overall inside the scoping plan, some of the agriculture strategies include livestock management, include, including manure and precision feed, forage, and herd management, as well as improving soil health and nutrient management, really concentrating on N2O reduction. There's also some strategies specifically addressing agroforestry, such as civil pasture, riparian buffers, and alley cropping, trying to get more trees on the landscape, incorporating climate mitigation and adaptation into overall planning, such as inside the AEM uh, program, as well as improving monitoring of greenhouse gas emissions. Right now, um, the agriculture sector generally uses Comet Planet, uh, Planner for a lot of their agriculture monitoring, and that's kind of nationwide. Comet Planner is what's used. but there's a lot of potential to improve that. And actually, uh, Cornell is going to be working on trying to figure out better um, monitoring methods with ag and markets in the near future here. Um, and the last, I guess, group of strategies are really focused on expanding technical assistance and support to landowners and well, farmers through the Climate Resilient Farming Program, the AEM program, the non-point source program, as well as potentially looking at payment for ecosystem services, which would probably be a bit further down the line. Next slide. So, oh, thank you for agriculture environmental management for the AEM program. <clears throat> so now I'm going to move into the forestry and forest side of things. And I'll start off by giving some more background on forests and forestry. Well, and landscape carbon sequestration, I suppose. Um, so overall, forests sequester the highest annual carbon per acre. They sequester more than wetlands, and they sequester more than grasslands. You see croplands emit carbon, but that's really due to land conversion from other land types, typically forest land, to croplands. Otherwise, croplands themselves, if you're not considering different changes in land use, um, do sequester a little bit of uh, greenhouse gases each year as well. But, and if you're thinking about carbon storage on the landscape, uh, wetlands and forests really hold the highest amount of carbon per acre. So that carbon storage is also important for preventing greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And you see grasslands and croplands also store a lot of greenhouse gases when you compare to developed land. So really our natural working lands are definitely going to be important inside climate mitigation. Next slide. So focusing on forest carbon specifically, I want to go over some terms and just the general cycle of forest carbon. So carbon sequestration is really the uptake of that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. It's pulling the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and directly storing it in the tree. But it has to include the uptake of the carbon dioxide. Next slide. So carbon storage is when that carbon is retained from the atmosphere. When it gets into the tree, it becomes lignin and other uh, tree fibers and really can be held on inside the wood and other products pieces of the tree. Next slide. And it can move between different storage pools. So some of that carbon can move into the soils directly or into mycorrhizal fungi. Some of it can move into leaf litter or even into wood products if that tree is harvested. So it can move around inside the ecosystem or even inside, you know, our own human world too. Next slide. Carbon can also be emitted into the atmosphere, so usually that's through decay or burning, so when trees might die from things like 
I don't know, hemoquilia adelgid, or if they become less healthy, they might start emitting some carbon into the atmosphere as well. But so climate mitigation is really looking at sequestration, offsetting emissions. So inside the Climate Act itself, um, we have the net zero goal, which is looking at how does all of the greenhouse gas emitting sectors, such as I don't know, transportation and buildings and industry, how does the greenhouse gas being emitted from those different sectors compare with the amount of carbon that's being sucked down from our natural working lands, such as our forests? But And the carbon benefits inside forests, as well as other natural working lands, really vary over the time, as well as the place. So you might have like a mature forest that's doing a little bit of uptake and storage and growth. It's probably storing a lot of carbon, but then there might be a fire. There might be some kind of insect or disease that comes in or a windstorm that kills some of the trees. So after that happens, for a little while, there might be higher emissions than storage and sequestration. And then, of course, the forest typically will regrow, and then you'll have higher sequestration. So younger forests do typically sequester more carbon per acre than older forests. And older forests, because they've had so long to sequester carbon, typically store a lot more carbon than younger forests. Next slide. Of course, why does this matter? Bringing it back to the Climate Act, that mitigation depends on the balance between sequestration and emissions. So it's that uptake of carbon dioxide annually from the atmosphere. And the Climate Act has that goal of net zero emissions by 2050. But so across the landscape, um, there's been a decrease in carbon sequestration inside New York State. And that's largely been driven by forests. Across the state, there's been a loss of forest land, and the forests get older. As those forests get older, sequestration tends to decrease a bit as the stand kind of you know, ages out a little bit. Um, there's also, of course, forest pests and invasive species, and those can hinder regeneration, the return of the forest on the landscape, and increase emissions and lower sequestration. Next slide. So right now, we're at about 28 million metric tons of carbon dioxide sequestration each year. 92% um, of that right now is by forests. Another 5% of sequestration is wood products each year. And that 28 million metric tons is offsetting about 7% of New York State's emissions. So the goal of net zero emissions would about be about 60 million metric tons of carbon dioxide by 2050. So we have to more than double the sequestration is what we're looking at. So thinking about the integration analysis for natural working lands, um, the majority of additional sequestration is expected to come from in reef state. But some of it might also come through other forest management and potentially like prevention of invasive species and some other things. But so the forestry strategies include keep forests as forests, which includes um, acquisition and an avoided conversion of forests, afforestation, reforestation, forest management, urban forestry, and municipal guidance wood use and bioeconomy, and workforce and market development. And I'll go into each of these, I guess, strategy groups a little bit more in depth here too. But, so for keep forests as forests, um, again, that's preventing conversion of forests to other types of land use since forests have the highest sequestration and one of the highest uh, carbon storage potentials out of all of our land. Um, Conversion overall has the potential for the largest loss in carbon storage and sequestration, as well as other ecosystem services. You know, our forests and our agricultural lands are, and our other natural working lands are important for a whole variety of things outside of climate as well as carbon. So I guess that's something to keep in mind too. Some of the specific components that 
were mentioned in the scoping plan was potential legislation for keeping forests as forests. I guess that would be similar probably to like our met wetland mitigation legislation where forests would be protected from conversion overall, but there might be some mitigation that could happen if forests were converted. Um, land acquisition is included, of course. 40B, which would be a tax program to pay kind of ecosystem services for landowners to keep their forests as forests and manage it for some sort of benefit. It wouldn't have to be timber like our 40A program right now. It could be for wildlife or some other use. We think that program would help landowners be able to hold on to their forests better, potentially. Um, potentially looking at things like regulatory stream buffer protection, uh, land use planning and solar siting. I know Ethan mentioned the Agriculture Technical Working Group. I don't think that was specifically cited in the scoping plan, but that is something I participated on too. And it is, I think, one way that NYSERDA and DEC and ag and markets are looking at kind of protecting forests and agriculture lands from conversion to solar and other renewable energy sources. Um, uh, other programs for acquisition like community forests and land trust grants are also mentioned too. Next slide. So afforestation and reforestation. Um, I'll start with the map on the right hand side. So the areas in darker blue green are areas where there's potentially more potential for afforestation, reforestation. So really the Adirondacks, there's not a lot of potential because there's already a lot of forests on the landscape, which is great. <laughs> um, but across the rest of the state, uh, afforestation, reforestation really has probably the largest potential for gain in carbon sequestration and storage, as well as other ecosystem services. Um, of course, this uh, strategy will be competing with other types of land use needs like agriculture and solar development, which we need all of those things on the landscape. So it will probably become about trying to cite the right things in the right places. And some of the specific components in the scoping plan include having a statewide reforestation plan written, agroforestry and agriculture programs, including that AEM program again, the non-point source program, climate resilient farming program, uh, trees for tributaries programs, buffer in a bag, uh, DEC's Regenerate New York program for private forest landowners, and trying to expand the tree nursery capacity and seed collection. Next slide. Hey, hey Molly, can you just real quick explain afforestation and reforestation for folks who might not know what that is? Yes, thank you. All right, so, um, so afforestation, reforestation, a lot of it's actually about planting trees. So afforestation would be Typically, the definition includes lands that haven't been forested within the past about 50 years and trying to convert those lands back to forest land. Reforestation are lands that have been forested in the past 50 years but aren't currently forested and trying to convert those lands also back to forest. Um, that can be through tree planting or natural regeneration and it might take some doing in some cases. All right, so forest management and harvesting are also included in the plan under the improved forest management um, piece. So harvesting can reduce local carbon storage but can increase sequestration over the long term. Forest management increases forest resiliency as well. Typically, it can help prevent forest losses where it can be actually done. Um, it can increase diversity, including species, age, genetics, structure, and functional diversity. And thinning can increase individual tree vigor. So especially for things like, like hemlock woolly adelgid, there are some studies out there that um, thinning those trees and getting more light on the trees potentially can make them more resistant to the adelgid and live a bit longer. Um, Forest management and harvesting also produces wood products that store carbon, which 
potentially can be used to replace other things that are not made from wood right now, like plastics and steel and concrete. Um, there's also additional cool benefits to having young forests on the landscape. Of course, not everywhere you want your mature forest as well as your young forests, but having some wildlife and wildfire risk reduction in some areas can be important too. Um, specific components looking at like this topic overall is invasive species prevention and control, um, the PRISMs, the Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management, uh, 480A, 480C, which could be something similar to uh, carbon markets or supporting landowners to participate in carbon markets, right to practice forestry law. Uh, there's also a component on researching forest soil and old growth forest carbon. And there's a project working on that right now, actually coming out of our office by uh, Sarah Hart and Josh Clegg, if you folks know those. Um, and there's another component looking at equipment caches and loan programs across the state to help support forest management too. But, <clears throat> so urban forestry and municipal guidance is another component or a strategy that was included inside the plan. Maintaining urban trees can also increase carbon sequestration and storage. And urban trees also have other benefits like lowering energy costs through shading, cooling communities, um, all of that preventing extreme heat and energy, as well as other health benefits too. Um, Specific components related to kind of urban forestry and municipal guidance include smart growth, land use planning, natural resource inventorying, uh, supporting DEC's urban forestry, and urban and community forestry program, and programs related to that urban forest community forestry program, including Relief, Tree Line, Tree City, and Tree Campus USA, which kind of support and guide. Uh, communities to planting more trees. Next slide. So another big part of the scoping plan was bioeconomy, which um, isn't just about um, wood utilization, but part of it is about wood utilization. So wood products with a long lifespan continue to store carbon for however long they exist. Using wood products instead of carbon intensive products can reduce carbon emissions, such as concrete and steel. That figure on the right hand side, actually, the left two bars are the amount of carbon dioxide that was used per square foot um, for wood dimension joists inside um, flooring for a house. And Using wood instead of concrete reduced the amount of carbon dioxide by about 454%, and using wood instead of steel reduces the carbon dioxide emissions overall throughout all of those processes by about 731%. So wood, using wood, durable long-term wood products can be really beneficial. Of course, there's other bio-based products which may or may not have carbon benefits depending on the wood source, what um, that wood or wood products or other bio-based products are replacing, how they're being used, how they're being sourced. There's a lot that goes into that, as well as um, potentially health concerns, which was dived into in the scoping plan a bit too. Um, overall, thinking about wood utilization, Specific components were focused on mass timber and building codes, new product research and development, and promoting waste material use. Next slide. So I think this is the last one, is about workforce development strategy, supporting the forest industry and trying to integrate carbon and climate resilience knowledge into industry and into foresters well. Some specific components include supporting the trained logger certification program, master forest owners, 
workforce carbon and climate training guidance and demonstration projects across the state, uh, forest carbon certification program, and the New York State Civilian Tree Corps, which is really potentially exciting. Next step. First slide. Um, so thinking about carbon, I think it's also not important just to focus on the carbon aspect, but also think about what other climate impacts are coming for our forests and what kind of resiliency our forests have and will have in the future. So some of the current impacts we're already seeing from climate change is the increase in invasive species, pests, and range, like hemlock woolly adelgid moving into the Adirondacks, um, increasing tree stress and mortality, increasing trail and road damage from longer mud seasons and more flooding. Some impacts we expect to see in the next 30 years is lower planting and regeneration success as deer mortality over the winter kind of drops down for a lot of parts of the state and they have higher success, which means they're going to be eating more of the regeneration that's trying to come up, as well as potential um, phenology missynchrony between pollinators and trees and lower um, viability of seeds due to um, more frost periods coming inside the spring and just, you know, that weird funky weather that's been happening in the winter lately. Uh, by 2100, that's probably when we're going to start to see changes in species composition. Right now, a lot of our mature forests probably won't be very vulnerable to climate change because mature, mature trees have like, I don't know, a lot of energy reserves to be able to deal with the climate stress. But it's more thinking about what forests are coming next and if those young trees will be able to better deal with the climate stress that's coming. But, so thinking about future climate vulnerabilities, probably a ways down the line for the next generation of trees. Um, riparian areas are probably going to be more vulnerable to flooding and storms. And some of those northern montane forests also probably will become more vulnerable to warmer and drier conditions in the long run. So also thinking in the long run, I've got that list on the left of more vulnerable species like beech, spruce, <laughs> balsam fir, uh, eastern hemlock, white pine, and on the left, I've listed some of the less vulnerable species like hickories and oaks, cottonwood, red cedar, sassafras. And of course, this is for the entire state, so not necessarily specific to your area. And I think those were all the slides I had. Yes, Molly, so I'm gonna take down, stop the screen share so we can do questions, you know. Okay, great. Great. Rush, you wanna kick us off? I know that you had a question. Sure, that last slide, I hate to see all the vulnerable species are the ones I love, but <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm a, a neophyte here. Um, the 480 A, B and C, uh, what are those programs, please? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so 480A is our current tax law program. So it provides tax uh, breaks to landowners who have timber harvesting on their entire product uh, property and produce wood products, horse products. Um, and they have to have a management plan in place to do that. So I guess that's it in a nutshell. A very small nutshell. Um, 480B would be a forest tax law program that is not created at all right now. That would be um, paying forest landowners or giving them a tax break to have some sort of forest management plan that the goal might not be for timber products. It might be for wildlife. It might be for carbon. It could be like a really broad range of things for a program. They'd still have to <coughs> have actions that would get them towards whatever their goal was probably in the program and they'd have to um, you know, commit to some of those actions, but it would be broader, it wouldn't be all about wood products. Uh, 480C is also 
a non-existent program that was listed in the scoping plan, and it would also be related to, um, you know, tax tax breaks for landowners. And it would have more to do with carbon, so it would be giving tax breaks to landowners who increase carbon sequestration or increase carbon storage, maybe something to do with climate. It's really up in the air right now since it's not a program, but we're potentially paying or uh, giving tax breaks to landowners for enrolling in a carbon market. So those Thanks. are what those potentially could be, yeah. So for questions, um, Georgina asked her question, then Aaron, then John, then Ethan. So let's go in that order. Um, Georgina, you asked a question about degradation of wetlands. Do you want to want to say that one more time? Uh, it was a graph that showed um, over time the net sequestration for different ecosystem or land cover types and wetlands was like positive. Um, and I know this isn't as important in the Adirondacks, um, but I, in terms of salt marshes, one of the things we're really concerned about in New York is just how they are degrading. And as they get more and more degraded, they can become a, a source, a net source rather than a nest sink of um, of carbon dioxide. So just wondering, or emissions in general. In general. So wondering if you have, um, how that was incorporated into this presentation or if it wasn't. Yeah, um, it really, wasn't incorporated into this presentation. I agree. I think so right now across the state wetlands actually are a net source of carbon dioxide, but how they're calculated in our greenhouse gas inventory, the um, emissions from wetlands are kind of taken out of that inventory right now. And I'm not really sure on the reasoning why for that, but if you read through it, it does present those numbers as well inside the inventory and I can probably find the link for that at some point too if you want. Cool I yeah I haven't read the whole thing so um, I'll, I'll go look into that thank you for that info. Yeah and thank you that's actually a really good point I should probably try to incorporate that into the graph too. Thank you Molly. Erin? Mm -hmm. Oh you're muted Erin. Mine was more on the comment that the uh, older the older the forest, the more or their inclination or belief that they're emitting more carbon. That really, in the case of New York State, that's really not the case. What really happens is under our 480A program, because you have a lot of cutting, you know, in these areas, and because it takes a long time before you know between that gap of what we call highly uh, 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 beneficial carbon sink trees at 50 years and better. Remember, new saplings are not really. You know, as I said, if you're putting in saplings, they're not going to be sequestering at a rate of a 50 year old tree or 50 to 100 year old tree. Uh, and also the destruction of the soils, how trees are extracted. Uh, soils are a very critical part of carbon sinks and carbon sequestration, along with all of the, you know, microbes as well as the fungi in the soil. So the current practices, plus the detritus that's left behind and decay, uh, that is what's really driving. And we can see that in the Amazon. Uh, you know, turning carbon sinks, you know, to, as they say, the, the net uh, carbon, you know, emitters. And so that really is, we want to be careful with the language because the term a lot of the forest product sector does is say, oh, the old growth forest is that we, the more of those we cut down, the better it all, because, you know, older the trees are, they're not really sequestering much. And yet they make the argument is that if you have wood furniture and all these other things, these continue to store carbon. So it's, it's, the logic and that just doesn't add up. And I just want to be careful about that language. Really what it is, is that the current scale of cutting and depletion of the soils, that really is what's leading to more of the area being a less effective carbon sink. So actually, um, there's a big kind of science misinformation push going on across the nation, and it started in Massachusetts, but it's really moving throughout the rest of the Northeast that older forests sequester more carbon than younger forests, and it's not true. And it looks like it's true when you look at papers from MUMA and some of the other literatures, but those papers are actually perspective papers inside the literature. They're not based on actual measurements. And a lot of them look at individual trees, so looking at older tree or 
you know, larger trees, when they grow, they can put on more carbon than younger trees, which is true. When a bigger tree grows each year, it's putting on more carbon than a single younger tree. But when you look at a forest scale, there's so many more younger young trees per acre than old trees. Those young trees are actually putting on more carbon than the older trees. So, so at least what I'm saying is when we, when we define young, we're not specifying the diameters, which is really critical. In fact, I got one of my friends is a national expert at the uh, John Muir Society in, in the Pacific Northwest because they basically do this argument because the forest product sector, sector out there, you know, it, it makes this counter argument, but it doesn't get into the detail. So it's a very nuanced and technical argument. So unless we're talking about tree diameters and tree age, as you're you're doing that analysis, that's really, really critical. So I think that that's, you know, we we definitely the data and what we're measuring and as we're putting forward, even summarizing the data, we should be talking about the age and, di and diameters of trees when we talk about younger trees. Uh, because if we have a crunch and we're trying to say within uh, 10 years, we must act, does it make sense to clear cut an area and then you're going to the regrowth rate of that area if you replant it is going to take anywhere from 50 to 100 years to get it at this stage where it becomes the desirable diameter and height of trees to be the most efficient carbon sequesters. So. Yeah, well, so the most so the fastest sequestering uh, age of forest is usually about 15 to 30 and then it so it's kind of like a curve and it it goes up for a little bit about 15 or 30 and then it slowly starts to go down. So yeah, when you get to maybe 70 or 100, it starts to level off a bit. And I'm certainly not saying old growth forests should be targeted, and certainly not areas that are, have serpentine soils or soils that are prone to losing a lot of carbon when they're harvested. And you wouldn't want to do a lot of soil de degradation. So it depends on the site where you would want to focus harvest. But it is important to have young forests across the landscape for carbon sequestration, too. Right. And I think. Yeah. And well, so but again, to 20, 20 to 50 years is that that optimum uh, range. So I, I point taken, but my point is, is that the monitoring and how trees are being clear cut and how they are right now under current progress, they're not really monitored. There's a, we could, could point to studies and then question is, what is the actual practice on ground? And mm -hmm. what is the actual management on ground? What? Yeah. Aaron, if, if I could jump in, and, and Molly, one other aspect that you had mentioned is how you know older forests are more resilient to changing climate, right? And I think that that's also a factor for us to consider. And I do the science is tends to be shifting around on this, but I do want to be cognizant of the fact that we have some other questions and then we have to jump to some years. So, no, Aaron, I think it's a good point. I don't think there is there is a lot of information floating around and it's not consistent. So I thank you for raising that. Um, I do want to ask Ethan's question real quick or John, she, John, John, she go ahead. Um, John had um, a question. Can DEC explain the statement that forest management reduces wildfire risks? So that's really site specific, of course. Um, so looking at this on a statewide scale, if you're thinking about like Long Island, you need to have those forests thinned a bit. You need to have the understory taken out to some extent to reduce the wildfire risk. And you're thinking it, it's, com all right, so the wildfire risk, you're looking at trying to get um, lower severity wildfire so it doesn't spread as far and so it can be suppressed and controlled. Um, <clears throat> when you do thinnings and kind of helped clear out the understory a bit, at least thin out the understory. Um, it helps prevent wildfire from jumping into the tree canopies, which is where wildfire spreads really quickly and really rapidly, and also at a really high severity. Um, I know it applies to jack pine stands inside um, the northern Adirondacks as well. As far as other stands, that might be harder to say, because a lot of them are more music and might not need wildfire risk reduction. If that gets at your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. asking that question. All right. And then Ethan, this is the final question that we have. Um, Ethan Winter asked, has DEC modeled forest change scenarios accounting for the most vulnerable tree species? So 
a lot of what we've done is based on um, the climate vulnerability risk assessments that were put out by NIACS, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. I figured it out. All right. Um, and they have uh, different publications for the Northeast as well as Mid-Atlantic. And unfortunately, that divides New York in half. So um, our overall vulnerability list, that list of species I put out, is really kind of a combination of those two different um, publications. And as far as modeling, uh, what does a really good job is there's the Climate Change Tree Atlas by the U.S. Forest Service. And that looks at, um, that has models for a huge variety of our different tree species. And you can search specific tree species to find what kind of habitat suitability they may have in the future. It's really what it's looking at rather than current vulnerability, although they're related. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Molly, thank you so much for your section and for your information here today. Totally appreciate your time. And now we're gonna go, oh, John, do you have another question? You're muted. Very quickly, yes. Uh, it does uh, DEC's plans on uh, uh, the climate scoping include wildlife management? And uh, I'll cite an example of why this I'm interested in this. A uh, large portion of forest management seems to be affected by the size and uh, veracity of the, or uh, appetite of the deer herd. Um, and uh, uh, we are learning more about the presence of wolves in the state and that being an apex predator for deer. Uh, it seems that there may be an inhibiting factor here with an open season on coyotes and most people being unable to differentiate between the species, especially down the scope of a rifle. Uh, it, there may be some benefit <laughs> to considering uh, closing that season for a period of time or in other ways restricting coyote hunting and, and trapping uh, in order to preserve that uh, emerging wolf herd or wolf population, I should say. So kind of unfortunately, I want to say that's not really addressed at all in the scoping plan, deer or wolves and coyotes. Um, and I'm in the land, the division of lands and forests here at DEC. So I think one thing we need to do more is talk more to the folks over in the division of fish and wildlife who actually sit on the same floor as us and try to work some of these things out because deer are so integral in our forest management regeneration. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Molly. Uh, and thank you for your time. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now is the time where we transition to Samir. If I can get this PowerPoint up. Great, can everyone? Yeah. Give me one sec, Samir. Samir, will you say where you're from and what you do? Yep. Okay, yep. good, thanks. Yeah, if <laughs> people can hear me, I guess I can start there until you pull up the notes. Um, yeah, so my, my name is Samir Ranade. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm a climate justice advisor. I'm based out of NYSERDA for about the past two years um, for the development of the scoping plan. I um, have been supporting the Climate Action Council's work in completing the scoping plan, had a lot of work particularly uh, around the climate justice chapter. And now I'm a part of uh, NYSERDA's energy climate equity team, but I uh, retain a lot of responsibility and um, just as, Molly kind of alluded to in this very last question, we need to uh, do more interagency coordination. And so I'm, I'm still involved in working with a lot of the state members of the council to make sure that we do that necessary interagency coordination. So um, my presentation will be fairly high level. I'll start out with buildings, electricity, transportation, cap and invest, and then I'll describe the uh, disadvantaged communities criteria and some of the implementation work that's happening around that to make sure that you know the programs are implemented effectively and equitably. Um, 
So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, great. And do you think you could put up in a way that where I can at least see some of the presenter notes? And not so that's what we were saying before. We can't do it on this. Okay. Screen. Um, let me, I, I can pretty much speak to these things, but I just, there, there's a lot of important points. So I just want to make sure I can refer to some of my um, notes as well. I think um, for the transportation sector, this basically applies to, um, you know, emissions from planes, trains, ships, farming equipment, and automobiles of all shapes and sizes. And the scoping plan envisions that by 2030, nearly half of all new light duty vehicle sales, that's cars and light trucks, and almost half of all new medium and heavy duty vehicle sales will be zero emission. Um, and a substantial portion of public transportation in urbanized areas uh, will shift, um, or yes, yeah, will uh, personal transportation will shift to public transportation in urbanized areas. And of course, you know, public transportation and alternative transportation isn't just subways and buses. Um, here in, in the North Country, um, that should involve engaging communities that don't have access to vehicles or can't drive and, and make sure that they that we have more effective programs like van shares and different types of car share programs. By 2050, the, the vision is that uh, virtually every vehicle on the road will produce zero tailpipe emissions, and there will be um, substantially greater access to um, low carbon modes of transportation of all kinds and services, including uh, public transportation. Um, a huge part of uh, achieving this objective, or th these goals will be achieved through a mix of regulations and investments. Um, the regulations include New York State's participation in California's zero emission vehicle program that basically sets um, annual targets for large manufacturers uh, pertaining to the amount of zero emission vehicles they make available for sale in the state. They have to make a, a, a rising number of vehicles, of zero emission vehicles available every year until 2035, 100% of all new light and medium duty models have to be zero emission or heavy duty, uh, the target year is by 2045, 100% of all models have to be zero emissions. And as I know, questions about this have come up. Um, the, these regulations do not apply to snowmobiles, chainsaws, or farming equipment, but there are program incentives to electrify those things. Um, and New York also has other types of, of fleet rules. Um, one of the most notable ones is a requirement for all new um, school bus purchases to be zero emission by the year 2027. Um, and, and providing financial incentives for buying these new clean vehicles. And of course, for the related charging infrastructure is, is very critical. There's a slew of money that's starting to come in from the Bond Act, which in particular provides a strong start for the investments we need in, in school buses. Um, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, both provide significant sums of money for charging and, and lowering the um, upfront cost of purchasing vehicles. Looking ahead to the on the horizon, uh, cap and invest could be another source of revenue. Um, and the scoping plan also proposes a clean transportation standard, um, which could also provide a revenue for charging um, and electric vehicle purchases. One thing to note about the clean transportation standard is that it, it can also accelerate the market for lower carbon drop-in fuels, because um, we can definitely anticipate that there will be, you know, when someone buys a car, um, they're going to own that car for a while. So the models on the road could be there till through 2040. But there is also a way to um, have, have cleaner liquid fuels that can just go into existing vehicles that can reduce the, the pollution produced by those fuels. Uh, along with zero emission modes of transportation, a, another very crucial aspect of the transportation plan is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. That's to you know, provide viable alternatives to single occupancy uh, driving. Um, and so that means really improving access to safe, affordable, uh, de um, dependable forms of public transportation services. Uh, like I mentioned, buses, subways, trains, ride share, van chairs, 
and you know we want to make it easy for people to choose alternative transportation. Um, and, and a part of this really comes into intelligently designing communities that will decrease the travel distance that people have to make between trips through a denser concentration and a greater mix of residential and commercial developments. And you know this would make walking and biking easier um, and safer. It would improve our health and it can open up economic opportunities through you know, improving access to education and job training centers, healthcare, retail, entertainment, all kinds of services. And of course, we need to incorporate equity within that to make sure that these types of developments are accessible to everyone. And, and a part of that is through ensuring that the developments are affordable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now I wanna go into buildings. Buildings are the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in our state. And it really, the solving uh, the carbon problem in this sector is a huge opportunity to create a significant amount of new jobs and um, create a, you know, an in, a thriving in-state supply chain and clean buildings industry. And, and these, these buildings, um, you know, they offer tighter envelopes, superior insulation, high-performing windows, improved ventilation, that'll improve health, safety, and comfort, and they will save um, money um, through energy efficiency. So these will be better buildings. The scoping plan's vision is that by 2030, um, most of the new <laughs> purchases for space and water heating uh, will be electric heat pumps, um, and 10 to 20% of commercial space um, will be utilizing them by 2030, and hundreds of thousands of homes and commercial offices will uh, become electrified, switching from gas to electricity every year. And, and by 2050, the vision is for the building sector seeing 85% of homes and commercial office space statewide having a diverse mix of heat pump technology and thermal energy networks. Um, I also, I'm sure you may know this, but just want to clarify, heat pumps also provide cooling and improving access to them is, is vital because um, you know, we're going to have extreme temperatures on both ends. We're going to have extreme cold and extreme heat. And so making sure that everybody can access this technology to keep warm or to keep cool um, as, as required will, will be important. Um, so the strategies in this sector, I'm happy to say that we have made significant progress on the first one, which is adopting zero emission codes in the fiscal year 2024 budget that was just enacted um, and supported by the governor and the legislature. We, um, New York has actually become the first state in the country to have uh, requirements for um, net zero, um, zero emission buildings for homes and offices. So by the end of 2025, all new buildings, seven stories or less, um, except large commercial and industrial buildings, will have to be constructed to produce zero emissions. By the end of 2028, um, the zero emissions codes will apply to all other buildings. I want to note, as I think this is an important issue here, wood stoves can still be utilized um, in, in that as, as part of these new buildings. There are um, a number of exceptions for um, for these buildings, like um, you know, backup of those uh, emergency backup and standby power, manufacturing facilities, restaurants, laboratories, car washes, laundromats, hospitals, crematoriums, agricultural buildings, and other types of critical infrastructure are exempted from that. But even those types of buildings we have opportunities to obviously still electrify them and make them zero emissions. Um, the, the, a large part of the scoping plan um, does envision providing incentives to uh, reduce um, the emissions from existing buildings, because we do need to tackle existing buildings, and that will be done to, to encouraging um, upgrades will be done through different types of programs. Um, we have the Empower program for low-income households that can provide full-scale retrofits um, they can also, we're working to also ensure that we address health problems that certain buildings have, which may prevent them from getting an upgrade. And then, of course, it can be weatherized and electrified. Um, there's, uh, um, so, so, so that's a critical thing. And uh, one thing I want to note, as you are probably aware, in the North Country, um, switching off of propane and oil can actually save a lot of money. Uh, particularly when it is is coupled with an energy efficiency upgrade. So uh, feel free to ask me in the Q&A if you have more questions about those specific programs. 
Um, the last thing I want to mention here is that another important source of greenhouse gases in buildings are hydrofluorocarbons, a very potent greenhouse gas that is in refrigeration and heating and ventilation, air conditioning equipment. And there are different strategies and regulations in place to reduce these emissions and provide low of global warming uh, replacements. Um, and, and so, for example, for refrigerants, um, this is really important and they, they may have a higher upfront cost. But the once you do that, once you switch it out, the, the operating costs are actually lower. Um, OK, so let's go to electricity. So for the uh, electricity chapter, um, as Molly kind of covered in, in the beginning, um, the, the vision for the electricity chapter is really laid out in the law itself. 70% um, of our statewide electricity <laughs> by 2030 will have to come from renewable uh, resources. Just to say what those are, there's like fuel cells, tidal, wave, ocean, geothermal, ground source, um, heat, um, solar, wind, hydroelectric dams. Um, and, and so part of achieving that uh, target, um, th that target will be bolstered by those requirements of distributed solar, energy storage, and offshore wind. And, and of course, it's not just going to be those are specific targets we have to meet, but we will be, you know, building out on land wind as well, and and also smaller scale uh, renewable energy, um, expanding energy storage. And, and by 2040, all of the electricity we consume will have to be come from zero emission sources, which may in, include um, nuclear. Um, so our our modeling on the future demand of electricity showed that. Um, it is expected to about double by 2050. Um, this will depend on the pace by which we can uh, switch out uh, the fossil fuels in transportation and, and buildings and what other alternatives might be available. Some key steps that we're taking to do this um, is basically uh, one of the top priorities is to retire fossil fuel power plants, starting with the oldest and most polluting facilities in New York City by 2030 and throughout the state by, by 2040. Importantly, there will also be um, thoughtfully laid out investments in transmission and distribution systems statewide and, and just a development of efforts to better manage our electricity demand. The ultimate outcome of incorporating renewables, having a well-developed grid, it will be a better performing, smarter grid. Um, and, and one thing to note, as an aside, for managing electricity demand, a critical priority in all of this is energy efficiency, which is really you know, the, the, the cleanest way to manage our demand. And so that's also going to be incorporated within this. But I, um, as you may be hearing this, I, I want to assure you, it is vital that we, have, that we maintain safety and reliability of the grid. And in fact, it will be improved. I'm, I'm really confident of, uh, about that. Um, next slide, please. So um, now I'm going to the cross sector strategies. The only one that I'm really going to be able to cover is the economy wide effort, the effort to ensure that we uh, meet our statewide targets by reducing em emissions across all of, of the sectors. But there's also things like land use and local governments and, and gas system transition, which I can discuss during the q and if you have questions on that. Next slide, please. So the scoping plan uh, recommended in the economy wide chapter cap and invest as the most environmentally effective and economically feasible way to guarantee that we meet our statewide greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. This was embraced by the governor in her budget that was um, just enacted. Uh, so DEC and NYSERDA right now are working to design a program that would set an annually declining cap on the greenhouse gas, gas emissions released by certain sources, each entity, um, responsible for the source would need to buy allowances through a market-based auction that in total, um, the number of allowances would add up to the amount allowed by the cap. The state would invest the proceeds uh, from those allowance sales into accelerating climate action. So uh, we are expecting to have a draft rule available for public comment by January 1st, 2024, and definitely looking forward to working with uh, Jackie um, and Jess on um, getting input on that. My particular objective is to engage disadvantaged communities. So, so if any of you have um, ideas on community groups on, on who I can engage around that rule, please let me know, because that's that's really my um, main interest. 
Um, the governor's priority in, in, in the budget um, was to ensure that we have a program that will equitably and effectively drive down emissions and you know, advance climate, economic, and environmental justice. So as part of the agreement, um, I just wanna break down um, on a high level what was agreed as far as the use of the proceeds. One third would be reserved for a consumer climate action account that would uh, create programs to deliver money to every household. Um, so 30% you know, of the proceeds would be would go to that that household households, 3% from that would go to an industrial small business account to offset um, any costs from a, the, any higher costs that may be incurred by small businesses. Two thirds of the revenue um, would go to the climate investment account, which would be used to invest in the transition to a green economy. Um, these investments would be prioritized to uh, benefit disadvantaged communities and reduce disproportionate air pollution burdens. One crucial aspect that I'm really excited about with this is that every project funded would be accompanied by labor standards. So um, yeah, next slide please. Sure. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm just gonna give like a high level overview um, about how Cap and Invest might work in our state, but, but this is just to provide general background all of the actual features in the program are still TBD and would have to be determined during the public rulemaking process. So first and most obviously, it must be established which entities are covered by the cap in order to meet the emission reduction targets. In New York, um, that's, that would be the distributors of heating and transportation fuels and large scale facilities that could include industrial op operations like manufacturing and waste to energy conversions. Um, as you probably know, um, New York State already participates in an existing cap and invest program for, for power sector emissions, which is called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that was established in 2005 as an agreement between Northeastern states. Um, it currently includes 11 states. And in aggregate, New York's participation in that, uh, along with all of the states, um, emissions have gone down by 50%, and they generated $6 billion dollars in revenue for investments in clean energy. And that's really just the cusp of even what that program uh, can deliver. And so, yeah, so the cap would be, would obviously cover more than electricity. It would extend to transportation, to buildings, to industry, to waste. Um, and each entity covered would be obligated to buy allowances at the market-based auction for the greenhouse gases that they seek to emit. Um, and each allowance would represent one ton of greenhouse gases. The total number of allowances available for sale at each auction would decline every year to correspond with the target that is set by the cap. Um, really important feature that the scoping plan recommends for New York is a price floor, which is basically a minimum bid amount um, that has to be submitted um, at the auction to protect it against anti-competitive behavior and try to provide a more predictable stream of um, investment proceeds. In, in many cases, the entities that hold allowances may be able to trade them amongst each other, um, the purpose of which is to enable more economically efficient greenhouse gas reduction. I wanna note though that the economy-wide chapter of the scoping plan has several potential design elements that could ensure the cap is implemented in a way that advances environmental justice. One proposal is to set an air quality cap at each facility that would require certain on-site reductions to occur every year. Um, the Climate Act also established a community-led air monitoring program that DEC is running. Um, the goal is to identify burdensome sources of air pollution and then develop solutions to reduce them. Those solutions could be funded by auction proceeds. So now, um, next slide, please. I wanna turn uh, towards the disadvantaged communities criteria and uh, discuss a little bit about how that will be used by the Cl Climate Act to target um, environmental burdens. Next slide, please. Um, so this past March, the Climate Justice Working Group voted on the final criteria that will be used to identify disadvantaged communities for the main purposes of targeting the reduction of greenhouse gases and associated um, air pollutants and the steering of the benefits of clean energy spending and related workforce and economic development. Of all of the spending on clean energy 
and workforce and economic development, 35 to 40 percent of those benefits have to occur in disadvantaged communities. So the criteria um, for a community um, includes 45 indicators of environmental exposures and burdens, climate risks, socio-demographic characteristics, and health outcomes. It lists 35%. 35% of New York census tracts are listed as disadvantaged communities. Actually, it'd be easier. I'll just say DACs for short. Um, 19 census tracts are federally designated reservation territory or state recognized tribal nation owned land also count as DACs. In addition, any household in the state, no matter where it is located geographically, that is at or below 60% of the state median income would count um, for the purposes of um, the clean energy and energy efficiency investments that those households may receive. So they would also count as, as disadvantaged. Um, if you want to view um, the, the map that I have there um, on the screen, please go to climate.ny.gov and, and go to the resources section of the website, then the disadvantaged communities criteria section, where you can pull up the map and interact with it and look at the different indicators and formulas. Um, so it, it's a it, there, there's a lot more to how the, the criteria was determined. Just at, at a high level, I, I think I want to note that um, they were all of the indicators were ranked, um, they were weighted. Um, there's also geographic considerations to ensure that um, the whole state was, was considered. Um, and um, we, and so through, through kind of multiplying environmental benefits with population characteristics, we would get a holistic score of, of the state. And if all of these were, were um, determined on a relative basis. So you, you look at the score of every single census tract, and then you know those that ranked um, the worst in terms of their conditions were were considered uh, disadvantaged. Um, you know, and as I as, as I noted, we we really uh, the the goal here on the clean energy side is to steer thirty five to forty percent of the benefits of the investments into these communities. As of now, compliance uh, with the benefits requirement will be demonstrated by the amount of dollars spent on place. Based programs, which are programs where the benefits are realized locally, like investments in community solar, uh, clean vehicle fleets, and retrofitting homes. Next slide. Um, so there are additional. Are we doing okay on time? Yeah, okay. Uh, we're twelve fifteen. So oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so th this slide is really in important. Um, so the there's other benefits. Obviously, I mentioned dollars are the compliance um, metric that we have right now. But obviously, clean energy and energy efficiency can yield a significant amount of other benefits that we are uh, uh, starting to track. Those include the reduction of the localized combustion of fossil fuels from um, switching out fossil fuels with clean energy and the air quality improvements. Um, there's a reduction in energy consumption and, and you know, the energy bill savings from energy efficiency. Uh, there's economic development in the form of jobs and job training. The creation of opportunity for minority women business enterprise firms and companies to engage in the clean energy industry and supply chain. There's also, you know, advancing something that's critical: advancing community self determination through building a, the capacity within community based organizations so that they can engage and participate in the transition. And I'll talk about that more on the next slide. Um, so it's important to note that the oppor um, the opportunities for these investments to benefit disadvantaged communities will vary significantly by geography and, and by the, you know, the power sector mix, by the region. And so what's really important is engaging communities to identify how programs can be designed and deployed so that we increase access uh, to them and, and, and they deliver tangible benefits. Um, so I wanna provide a little bit, there, there's a couple of key points that I, I really want to emphasize here is that the state is currently developing a process for tracking and reporting on the benefits um, and the positive outcomes for DACs. Um, the benefits that we count, you know, they have to be measurable and verifiable by every state entity that is doing clean energy investments. And, and, and the scope of the investments that are realized would certainly not be limited to even those that you see on the screen. 
One thing that we are doing at NYSERDA um, is to try to design programs that deliver a, even a wider range of benefits because the, the optimal goal is, you know, we have the disadvantaged communities criteria, which has 45 different indicators. And so the goal is to actually reduce the burden, the disparity that is represented by each of those indicators. You know, that includes um, drive time to rural hospitals, manufactured homes, um, um, income, education, there's all kinds of things there. And so we actually want to cut down on the disparity for those. And so NYSERDA is working on, on developing strategies uh, to, to do that. Um, and another very important aspect, it's not only providing the funding, which is obviously a crucial step, but we actually just, we have a lot of programs right now. Part of the problem is that they may not be accessible. And so we just need to overcome the barriers to accessing them. Um, next slide, please. And I, I want to make sure there's enough time for Q&A, so I'm, I'm probably not going to go too deeply into these next slides, but um, I just want to quickly say that NYSERDA has launched um, something that I'm very excited about called the Energy Equity Collaborative. It has 13 uh, stakeholders um, who will help us in program design. It's also an interagency body because interagency coordination is vital. DEC is on there, DPS is on there. Um, and so uh, we will be able to design programs uh, more effectively with community input. That is the goal of this. And it's also to really overturn every stone and ensure that under resourced underrepresented groups across the state have a way to engage. Um, and there's also a disadvantaged community stakeholder services pool, which would compensate um, stakeholders for their time and expertise. I think that's really important. Um, next slide, please. And la last thing I'll just say, and I'm sure you've probably heard of this, and the, the regional clean energy hubs in every economic development uh, council region of the state. Uh, NYSERDA has launched a clean energy hub three in New York City. Their goal is essentially to act as a customer service arm of not just NYSERDA programs, but really federal programs, local programs, and to make sure that, that everybody is aware of the incentives. They're doing a barriers analysis, particularly for disadvantaged communities to make sure that we can um, uh, make these programs accessible to everyone and, and they will play a vital role in, in really getting clean energy on the ground out there. So I'll, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank okay. you. Sorry, no, no, that's perfect timing. Ten minutes. Right. Should I just go back to my desk? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Samir, for that Thanks. overview. That was really helpful. Um, I'm sure there are questions in the chat, but does anyone want to kick us off first with a verbal question? If not, there are two queued up. Sure, let's go for it. All right. So John Sheehan asked both of these questions. The first one. Uh, John asked, are outdoor wood boilers still legal? He was thinking that they were being phased out, but he still sees them being installed in rural areas. Um, I believe they are still legal. I, I have not heard. I mean, I can't, you know, since I'm not like a wood person, I can't differentiate between wood stoves and wood boilers, but I have, I have not heard anything that would bar wood um, because wood wood is not a fossil fuel, and, and so um, yeah, I, I, I would, I'm virtually certain that they can still be used. If Molly is on, I mean, maybe she could confirm that. But looks like she hopped off. I can get back to you on that, John, just to 100% confirm it. But I'm pretty sure there. Thanks. Uh, we we were involved in an effort with NYSERDA and DEC essentially to eliminate these. I thought the legislature had passed a law to make that happen or that DEC had actually adopted rules to make that happen. But there was a, it was unpopular. And I think there was an effort to, uh, in some way, weaken or overturn that. I haven't heard much on the progress of how that's going. So uh, I'd just be curious to, to know because the outdoor wood boiler, unlike the uh, uh, highly efficient wood furnaces or wood stoves that are certified uh, under the program that EPA runs and that NYSERDA has been helpful in keeping uh, on its toes because its original its list got a little shaky under the trust, Trump administration. Um, uh, the outdoor wood boilers are these large, uh, generally very inefficient, um, heavily particle polluting um, uh, devices that are put in somebody's backyard and used to create heat in some kind of a building. 
uh, by connecting the two through a, a venting system. But uh, uh, they generally will burn any kind of wood, <clears throat> and uh, uh, it tends to be popular with people wanting to dump trash and that sort of thing into it as well. But it becomes an all-purpose uh, burn, not burn barrel, but incinerator in the backyard. Um, and we uh, that has a big impact on rural air quality. We'd love to see something uh, included in in trying to get those finally uh, out of use in the state of, state of New York. There was a replacement program for a while where the state uh, would buy your inefficient one and replace it with one that actually worked. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know if that's still in effect either. I, NYSERDA was involved in creating that incentive, but that was probably a decade ago. Um, thank you. I had one other question about allowance trading. Um, the current regional greenhouse gas initiative that covers the 11 or 12 states in the Northeast um, has a, a trading program that we participate in by going to the auctions and actually buying allowances and then retiring them. Uh, and in that way, helping to reduce the overall cap by removing allowances from the market that would otherwise be used by someone to create pollution. Um, we then, uh, as an organization, pledge to hold on to those forever, and uh, we have a retirement program where people essentially make a donation to the organization, and we will send them a certificate commemorating their retirement of that allowance, but the allowance never leaves our account. Um, so it can't, you know, we don't sell them to people who will promise not to use them and then have to worry about that later on. We just never let go of them. So uh, is there a way to participate as a citizen or do you, uh, uh, in this program, is it broad enough that uh, everybody in the economy has to participate and that doing what we're doing in this current system would actually still be a, a viable thing? Yeah, so um, I, I wasn't aware of, of, of that effort under Reggie, so that's uh, really interesting to know of. Um, the, the compliance obligation would obviously, uh, that would only apply to those that, um, you know, emit greenhouse gases. In terms of who else and how they can participate in the program, all of those details would be, need to be determined in the rulemaking process. So I would, if you have particular thoughts or ideas on that, um, I think the public comments in the rulemaking is where to offer those. Okay. Because well, that's on PVD. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, just a general question. As owners of a uh, uh, building in downtown Albany, we have some emissions from our gas fired furnaces in that place. Is it, are we going to be part of the program or are we going to be too small to have to participate? Um, well, I, my guess is you would probably be too small to participate. Um, I think most programs. Um, are 25,000 tons of CO2. Um, uh, so yeah, that would be my guess. But uh, obviously that would also be determined during rulemaking who's covered. But yeah, I wouldn't imagine that. But the, your fuel source would be covered though. Um, um, but not, not not through the on-site emissions. It would be through the up, upstream purchase. Uh, if you if you mentioned you've been using some fossil fuel, then that would be covered through the at the upstream point. Got it. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you, Samir. You were talking about the energy equity collaboration. That's an intra-agency yeah. effort. Is that going to look at regional agencies for the state? They're not necessarily statewide, but you know, at one point we were talking about the Adirondack Park Agency. Are those types of entities can they engage in that type of collaboration or collaborative, or is it meant to be more statewide? Well, it is meant to be statewide in scope. Um, those are the groups and. Um, Thus far, participation, you know, is limited to the agencies that are on it. So, but but that doesn't mean that that, you know, through some other way, maybe through that body, um, organizations or uh, the council itself it could be engaged. I, I guess we would need to talk about that, but it's it's not intended to engage the park agency right now. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Question. Questions. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to how to phrase this, but I kept thinking that well. You know what's what's our role in this? You know what interest should we, as the Adirondack Council, be thinking about? And I think about all these towns in the Adirondacks. Most of most of the population and most of the towns would not qualify as disadvantaged by your definition. Um, yet I think it's really important that we find a way to draw them into this, yeah. 
we want them part of the virtuous cycle of taking part in, 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 in emission reduction uh, that comes with forest management and other things. Um, and um, uh, you know, if they, they don't see themselves and you by your definition probably don't see them as disadvantaged, uh, but in some sense they are. Um, and if we're going to, you know, come to them and say, uh, this, this statewide initiative, this whole scoping plan is something that applies to you too, not in a punitive way, but in, a, in, in a, as an opportunity. Um, I, I think we've got to find some way to broaden, uh, you, you know, kind of your definition of, of environmental justice. Um, the other thing I'd say with regard to the energy um, uh, cooperative, um, I didn't see the Department of Corrections in there. Um, they have uh, exaggerated importance here in our region. Um, and it seems to me they, we ought to find a way to get them in there even, maybe they are, but I didn't see it. On the list. Yeah. John is coughing. <laughs> what was John? He was coughing. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, those are great points. I, I guess, or, yeah, on on the first one, yeah, I I, I think the the a, a core purpose, you know, of having uh, the disadvantaged communities criteria is to ensure that no one is left out. Yeah, um, and and because you know that's been the case with a lot of um, with the implementation of, of of these programs. So that is why it it sets you know a bar of it, ensuring at least thirty five to forty percent of the benefits of these actions benefit disadvantaged communities. You know, but but that does not you know mean that that the the availability of all of these programs you know are exclusive to anybody. I mean, and and this is also the obligation of the state to ensure that we meet the target, the disadvantaged communities yeah. target. Um, but insofar as the public is concerned, I mean, all of these programs that we have, I mean, they're they're going to be you know accessible to everybody, and so to the same the, the same degree of. Of, of motivation and ump that we need, they, they needs to be to every, everybody. So, so the, there's nothing that you know that reduces that motivation. But I, I guess the other thing I would say is that due to the fact that low income households, no matter where they are, do qualify, um, then um, you know it is possible that in those towns there are households that, that qualify. And I, I think the the important, a really important takeaway um, is that we need to make the benefits of the clean energy economy real. We need to, we need to deploy these programs. Um, and, and so people can access the, not just the higher performing technology, but all of those other benefits from, from the jobs, the health. Well, like make sure that those are centered locally, you know, ever, everywhere, because that is going to also, I think it's going to be crucial to just building support for this transformation that we have mm -hmm. to uh, underdo, um, un undergo, but you know, it'll also just, people will see it. And I, I think that will also motivate people to be involved. And so I, I would say, um, you know, I certainly am, want to work with Jackie and Jess on engaging low-income communities, because I think that is really a crucial way to, to solving this problem in the most, you know, ethical and, and moral manner. And I think that's required by the law, but, but, as, but still like, let's talk more, but, but I think we can work together in, in just promoting um, for lack of a better word, the effort and making sure that people are aware of, of the benefits. And that's certainly not not limited, um, you know, to yeah. any part of the state. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that um, people who are under 60% the state medium income, yeah. under what, it would be applicable for the clean energy efforts. So mm -hmm. do you happen to know what that is off the top of your head? I, I'm sorry. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. We can follow later. Yeah. Yeah. So we're about at time. Um, unless there's any other burning questions, I think it is appropriate that we wrap up. Um, any hands, quick hands, seeing none. Samir, thank you so much. I oh, thank you. Appreciate yeah, you being here yeah. and sharing yeah. time with us. Oh, John. <laughs> Sorry, Jackie. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that household uh, qualification is going to be a very important thing inside the park. Um, as we're seeing, communities as a whole are, are seen as having an extremely low environmental burden in the Adirondacks. 
even if they're sitting next to a pond where the trout have got mercury in them. So that's a, a concern for me overall, but having the fact that there are, uh, uh, is qualification for lower income households, it, it makes a big difference in communities with wide disparity between income in the seasonal and their year round housing. So that, that, that's something we'll have to focus on much, much more as an organization, I think. Yeah, I think that's definitely a role for the council to play and, and think about while understanding that there are communities across the state that are experiencing much heavier burdens from the current emissions and pollution efforts right now. And so just understanding where we fall on that scale, I think is also important. So. And we don't want local government officials to miss this because they see that they, the community doesn't qualify, but there will be people inside those communities that will. Yeah, and Samir, uh, him and I have talked uh, previously and agree that like that's an important thing that we need to continue to elevate uh, for people outside of the Adirondacks and recognize that these communities do have some um, burdens that need to be seen and addressed. Work workforce is just the last thing I, I would uh, allude to is there are priority populations that um, would qualify or programs dedicated to bolstering the workforce. Um, and, and so I'm sure many people within this region as across the state would, would qualify for that. I mean, there's nuances there and how we would collaborate on that, but I think our collaboration, you know, should could and should focus on workforce and economic development. Hey, Aaron. <laughs> which I know. Yeah. You know, <laughs> One of Aaron the, works. Yeah. the mountains. Um, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and sign us all off, but thank you for joining here today, folks, and we'll catch up another time. We'll see some of you tomorrow. All Thank right. you all. Bye.